My name is Martinez Galenzi, and I'm, uh, I'm very excited to be able to start this evening. This is the first ambitious city event being held by the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce under the leadership of Keenan Loomis as the new CEO. I love the term ambitious city. And I know Keenan's going to address this in a few minutes, but it's a term that was kind of thrown at us by another city that we recently beat in a football game. It was not Winnipeg. <laughs> We're gonna, we have a fantastic evening coming up this evening. It's, uh, it's gonna be really, really interesting to hear from our, our keynote speaker, Jennifer Kiesmat, the chief planner of the city of Toronto. And Rob Ford is strictly off the table for tonight. We're talking about city planning, we're talking about things that are exciting and upbuilding, and so we're gonna leave all of that at the door. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Keenan Loomis. Keenan, I met several years ago when he was first uh, when he first came to Hamilton before he began at Innovation Factory, and uh, I met him actually at a kind of a meet and greet organization being or event being held by the Hamilton Economic Development Department, and this tall, disgustingly good-looking guy comes walking up to me, and I was disgustingly not good-looking, wearing a T-shirt and jeans and and uh, he said, I just met this guy called Glenn Norton. And he told me to go, uh, or I, I figured, you know, I should go talk to whoever was wearing a suit. It's like, so why are you talking to me? And Glenn said, well, because sometimes you wear a suit, so you should go talk to Martinez. And from there, we started working on a few little projects, and from there, he then went to Innovation Factory, and now is the CEO of the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce. So from the first day he landed in the city, he went and started meeting people, and he is still doing that, and he's doing pretty exciting things for the chamber. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you, ladies and gentlemen, Keenan Loomis. Thank you, everybody. What a great turnout. I want to welcome you to the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce's first ambitious city event featuring tonight our distinguished keynote speaker, Jennifer Kiesmat, Toronto's chief city planner. Every time you uh, create a new event, the people that uh, need to be thanked first are the sponsors that uh, have faith that you know what you're doing. And so I want to thank first our, our presenting partner, RBC Royal Bank, uh, Carmela Trombetta and her incredible team here uh, locally in Hamilton. Um, RBC has been a major contributor to the business community over the last number of years, um, and not just with sponsorship money for uh, events like this. Uh, I see Carm and her team uh, downtown and, and various uh, RBC staff from the various branches around town all over Hamilton all the time. Um, RBC is definitely giving back to this community, and our community is stronger because of it. I also want to thank our media partners, Kojiko and its local affiliate, Cable 14, also consistent contributors to this community. Cable 14 is uh, taking local broadcasting to a whole new level now that it's broadcasting in HD. I saw Lions Lair in HD, it looked incredible. Can't wait to see this event uh, in HD as well. And uh, I look forward to uh, doing a lot of other things with, uh, with you, Glenda and Brent. Uh, we have uh, a lot to work on and I have a lot of uh, ideas, so get ready. Our city building partner is Hamilton International Airport. Uh, which has made its support of uh, city building initiatives at the Chamber a key priority for them, and I thank them for that. And finally, I want to acknowledge Soundbox uh, Productions, our audiovisual partners. You see these guys at all kinds of events in, in the city, and uh, there's a reason for that. They're incredible at what they do. So uh, thank you to tonight's sponsors for making Ambitious City a reality. So why did we choose to call this Ambitious City? Most of us know that Hamilton was once known as Ambitious City because until not too long ago, it was in fact a punchline. But many of us aren't aware of the origin of the moniker. Uh, you have it at your tables, uh, but for the benefit of those watching on TV, I'd like to share it. And the story goes that in 1847, the Globe newspaper in Toronto called Hamilton the Ambitious City in a derisive way suggesting that Hamilton had ambitions far exceeding its talents. Well, Robert Smiley, the first uh, editor of The Spectator, came to Hamilton's defense saying, ambitious city was a proud and perfect descriptor 
of a community with great potential. Quote, we hope our neighbor is not becoming jealous of the manner in which we are going ahead or envious of the spirit displayed by our public men. In all that betokens enterprise, public spirit, and future greatness, Hamilton will hold its own with any city in the province. The ambitious little city threatens speedily to become a prosperous large one. I like that. And I think it's time to take back the ambitious city name and own it once again. We are no longer a city in decline. Key indicators are all headed in the right direction. And it's clear that what's going on with the new Hamilton, the buzzed about Hamilton, what's going on on James North, Lock Street, Ottawa Street, and in all of our downtowns throughout the community, is that ambition is returning to the city. And that's what the Chamber of Commerce likes to see. For the ambitious, the ones who are pulled in by Hamilton's important place in Canada's history, its authenticity, its urban scale, its physical beauty, its bountiful assets, its palpable reemergence, its opportunities, and its unlimited potential, we are determined to continue to strive and push because we can be so much more. And that requires all of our leaders to embrace ambition, again in Hamilton, and it requires us to do it together because only through collaboration will we have the capacity and alignment required to get a lot of hard work done. For our part, the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce is doing its best to help take advantage of all the positive things that have, have occurred in this community over the last few years, in spite of ourselves, it seems, at times, and in spite of fierce global headwinds. We are doing our best to continue to push so as not to lose momentum. Today actually marks my six-month anniversary since taking over at the Hamilton Chamber. It's been a privilege to work every day on behalf of our members, being their voice in the community and at City Hall, and most importantly, their partners in business. One of the best aspects of this job for me is that what is best for Hamilton is also what is best for our members. So my incredible team and I have been hard at work on a rather substantial agenda. And I'd just like to share a little bit about that and what we're working on. Two years ago at the Hamilton Economic Summit, five priority areas for economic development were identified for the city. Life sciences, transportation, creative industries, education, and manufacturing. Since then, considerable resources from the chamber have been dedicated to advancing these agendas. With regards to life sciences, in January, a full year of hard work by a lot of people will culminate with the chamber's release of a report focused on developing a life sciences cluster in this community leveraging the uh, significant research, teaching, and healthcare delivery institutions that we have in the city, and helping generate more commerce and exports out of it. After the launch of the report, the Chamber will be reconvening in February the key stakeholders in life sciences to work on next steps, and we intend to make considerable progress in 2014. With regards to transportation, our commercial district and neighborhood renewal task force comprised of representatives of the City of Hamilton, the Realtors Association, the Home Builders Association, the BIAs, businesses that are members of the Chamber, many of whom are here tonight. Thank you for the support. We are working with the McMaster Institute of Transportation and Logistics to study the economic impacts of fully embracing complete streets philosophies. In other words, looking to address the economic dead zones we have created on our main streets downtown and creating the types of environments where commercial activity and neighborhood development flourishes. Pertaining to creative industries, we have convened a task force of creative industry leaders to help us figure out how a chamber of commerce can enhance creative commerce and build on the city's high quality of life, which is the best economic development tool in the hands of cities today. In education, we intend to bring together McMaster and Mohawk in the business community to address workforce development, and I hope that we can advance that agenda in 2014. And with regards to manufacturing, a lot of recent work has been undertaken by ECDEV and key stakeholders like Arcelor Middle DeFasco. And I think 2014 will present a lot of opportunities to take on policy issues related to manufacturing. And all of those initiatives are needed to keep Hamilton the most diverse economy in Canada. On top of that, we are br uh, also bringing the voice of business to the table and working with the city of Hamilton as it undertakes its open for business review, a massive internal review to look at how red tape can be reduced in Hamilton to address long-standing frustrations on opening or expanding a business in this community. And the city has done a great job in recognizing the problems and good people are working hard within City Hall uh, to initiate change, but we see the frustrations of business owners all the time. We will be monitoring progress and helping the city break down the barriers to doing business here. And we have scores of people 
in committees, innovation and technology, ambassadors, human resources, and divisions, Glanbrook, Dundas, Ancaster, and young, the young entrepreneurs and professionals that meet to do work each month. And as you can see tonight, events are also a key part of our operations. Uh, coming up on January 8th, we have the Mayor's State of the City Breakfast. You can buy your tickets now at hamiltonchamber.ca. We have the Citizen of the Year Awards coming up on January 21st, and nominations are open as we speak. The Outstanding Business Achievement Awards are happening in March, and nominations are open for that as well. And finally, on events, we are working hard to bring key leaders back to the Hamilton Economic Summit and making it relevant and productive. Look for that to occur in May. And that's on top of all that we do each and every day to work for our members, be their partners in business, connect them and facilitate business for them, and meeting so many of their various needs, whatever they are on a day-to-day -day basis. We are a small team, boosted by so many other contributors and volunteers, and motivated by our devotion to the city. We are an ambitious little organization, and we have only just begun. But we need your help. We can't possibly do this on our own, but we will do all that we can. And I think that tonight is a great start. If Ambitious City is about the Chamber's membership of almost 1,100 businesses and institutions and their 75,000 employees looking to provide leadership in city building, well then what better way to kick it off than to hear from one of, one of Canada's top experts in city building, Jennifer Keysmet, the Chief City Planner for the City of Toronto. And the best part of this is that she's not just one of those experts that flies in from out of town and tells us what we need to do as a city without knowing what the city is all about. She's a Hamiltonian, born and raised, and joined by her family here tonight, her father Len, her mother Irene, and so many other family members, and it must be a real treat for you to be able to do this, Jennifer. As a recently engaged chief planner for the City of Toronto, Jennifer is committed to creating places where people flourish. Over the past decade, Jennifer has been repeatedly recognized by her peer associations for her innovative work in Canadian municipalities. Most recently, Jennifer was named one of the most influential people in Toronto by Toronto Life and one of the most powerful people in Canada by Maclean's magazine. Her planning practice is characterized by an emphasis on collaborations across sectors and broad engagement with municipal staff, councils, developers, business leaders, NGOs, and residents associations. Her priorities include developing a divisional strategic plan, leading an official plan review process, refining public consultation, to provide more access to city building conversations, transit planning, mid-rise development on the City of Toronto's many avenues, and overseeing development review for over 4,000 applications annually. Jennifer is the founder of Project Walk, which premiered its first short film in 2011 as an official selection at TIFF. In 2012, Jennifer debuted her first TED Talk, Walk to School, and in 2013, she delivered her second, Own Your City. Jennifer is a graduate of the University of Western Ontario, I will not hold that against her, and has a master's in environmental studies, politics and planning from York University. Jennifer has clearly distinguished herself since uh, leaving Hamilton to go to university, and it is my high honor and distinct privilege to say welcome home. Jennifer. Thank you so much to the Chamber for inviting me to be here today, and this does feel like a homecoming of sorts, which is fantastic. It's an absolute honor to be here with you, and in part because I honestly can't think of a moment in the past 15 years of my professional life where there's been a whole table of keys mats in the room. <laughs> so a special welcome to my family who's here this evening. In anticipation of being here, I've been thinking about and reading a lot about this city. And I've been wondering about the ways in which it has shaped who I am. Of course, when I lived here, the city was not yet amalgamated, but my memories do take on the entire region. I recall tripping down the streets of Dundas and hanging out in the library as my mother took classes at the Dundas Valley School of Art. I ran my very first cross-country race when I was 11 years old in Spring Valley. And subsequently, I spent many, many years on its trails, and it has become one of my favorite places to run. 
I have memories as a child, thanks to my dad, of canoeing in Coots Paradise and hiking the Bruce. This is a breathtaking region, a startlingly beautiful natural landscape, much of which has been lovingly, carefully protected. As an aside, I think this is a benefit of moving away, that I've been able to come back and see this city and see this region with new eyes. I moved to, to Western, as you heard. I've also lived out in Vancouver. I've had the great opportunity to travel to many of the great cities of the world. And I come back to this city of my childhood, and I'm astounded by its beauty. Interestingly, as I have thought about my experiences of the city of Hamilton, I've thought a lot about how I have moved through this city from place to place. Some of you may have seen my TED Talk where I talk about my walk to school straight down West 5th Street and I compare that walk to my daughter's walk in Midtown Toronto. And just for the record, my walk was longer. But in that story, I left out a very important piece of how I moved about, which was, of course, the HSR. This was a bit unfair, because when I think back to my high school years, I remember I was zipping all over this city on the HSR. I was taking the bus. Actually, I don't really remind, remember riding the bus much, but I vividly remember waiting for the bus. All over this city, I waited for the bus. Or I was traveling on my $10 garage sale special gray 10-speed bike, you know, with the hooked over handlebars. And whether I was taking it to my Hamilton Spectator paper route, yes, I was a paper girl. Or to my first ever part-time job at Lime Ridge Mall. I remember the week it opened. I was actually 11 years old. And if you can imagine, some of you in the room probably can, it was in a sea of farmer's fields. But my favorite memory of this city is in fact distinctly Hamilton. And it involves that 10 speed bike. And it's this, carrying my bike on my shoulder back up the mountain to get home. I distinctly remember the agony, that moment of thinking, there's absolutely no way I can do this followed by the clear knowledge that I had no choice. <laughs> I know what it's like to stand at the bottom of a mountain. Okay, it was our mountain, the Niagara Escarpment. But to stand at the bottom of a mountain as dusk is falling and to know that my curfew is upon me and that I need to somehow get to the top. To paint the picture in my memory, I've just finished a grueling track practice. I used to train at Mac as well as in Gage Park. And my legs are like rubber. And this is before the days of Gatorade. And my electrolytes are low. But somehow, through sheer will, I get home. I live to tell the tale. So maybe the upshot here is that in this city, with both its natural beauty and its mountain to be climbed, maybe this city inspired me, but it also made me tenacious, persistent, persistent determined. My friends, not only was this good training for life, as you can imagine, but it was exceptional training for city building on many, many levels. Because creating a great city is far from easy. So Hamilton, I hear you have ambitions. Good, good. But what does it mean to be an ambitious city? What are the ambitions that we all in the room share? I believe it is imperative to start here with the ambitions that are shared because it is impossible for a city to move forward in the absence of a shared vision. The crux of our shared interest, I believe, can be probably summed up quite simply, and it is this, shared 
prosperity, or maybe prosperity for all. What does city building have to do with this shared interest? Well, I would like to suggest that there are timeless principles of city building that are critical to generating shared prosperity in the 21st century. If we can agree that this is our goal, most broadly put, it's shared prosperity, and that maybe this is just very broadly stated, the vision that we're working towards, that this is in fact worthy of our most coordinated efforts, our sophistication, our highest intelligence, the key question then becomes, how do we get there? How do we get there to shared prosperity? Well, I believe there's a series of timeless principles in city building, and I'd like to share them with you because I think they lay the groundwork for some of what I'd like to talk about next. And I'll spill the beans a little bit with, what, uh, with respect to what I'd like to talk about next because after these principles for city building, I'm going to talk about some hard truths. I'm amongst family here. So I'm going to talk about some hard truths that I believe face the city of Hamilton. But first, principles for great city building. And the first is this, in great cities, places and streets are designed for people. This may sound a bit obvious, but in fact, it's not what we've done. Think about some of the great cities of the world, Paris, of course, or Rome. Think about Barcelona, a wonderful place to linger. Even New York City, that back when I was a kid in the 70s was a scary, dark, noxious place. Even New York City is transforming its streets to become places not for cars, but places for people. Although this is a timeless principle, many of our streets have in fact in the past generation been transformed through bad planning, really. They've been transformed to be, to be places for moving cars. By doing so, we have taken away the places that are central to our community life. Streets where people linger and interact. Streets that are the heart of local commerce. They've disappeared. Complete streets that are walkable, enjoyable destinations for arts, culture, and entertainment. The paradigm for planning our cities over the past several generations has in fact looked like this. It's been based on the assumption that what we need in our cities and what we want in our cities is more cars. And as a result, we've built car-oriented streets, which means great, big, long, blank facades on our buildings. And as a result, the distances have become farther and farther spread out in our cities. And as a result, we need more infrastructure because we're trying to accommodate more cars. Sound familiar? Well, in fact, the new paradigm, the paradigm for great cities is about focusing on more people. More people need people-oriented streets. More people need buildings that are designed with lots of activity happening at grade. People-oriented cities need shorter distances. We need to bring things in close. And as a result, you need less infrastructure on a cap per capita basis in a people-oriented city. Now, you know, you know what I'm talking about because you have this in your city. You have it in small increments here and there. You have it on James Street North. You have it in Hess Village. But in great cities, we design places and streets for people as a first principle. Now, our second principle for designing great cities is in fact about neighborhoods that have main streets, connecting those two ideas together. When, neighborhood, when neighborhoods have main streets, it's possible to walk as a part of everyday life to get to the doctor, to go to the dentist, to buy a gift for a birthday party next door, to just pick up something at the butcher or the bakery. You can do this within walking distance in cities where neighborhoods and main streets have been brought together in close. Now this is a fundamentally different way of life than streets that are designed for cars. 
Living in a neighborhood with main streets is very different from living in neighborhoods that have housing only. In these neighborhoods with main streets, and this is a slide that, this earlier slide that you see here is in fact from, from Berlin. These are places where you have multiple destinations within a five minute walk of home. Within a 10 minute walk, there might be a little bit less, but there are multiple destinations that give you a reason to be in public space. Moving around in a variety of different ways is essential in a great city, and main streets alongside of neighborhoods allow us to do this. Now, this is a little bit of what my neighborhood looks like. You can see my uh, kids' schools there in, in green, and the shorter ring on the, the inner ring is a five-minute walking radii. These are all of the amenities that exist within walking distance of where I live. I'm very lucky. This is a wonderful place to live for this reason. When I moved into the neighborhood that I live in now, I changed my doctor, I changed my dentist, I changed the person who cut my hair, I changed the pace where I bought my bread, because I wanted to do all those things within a five minute walk of home. And this in fact contributes greatly to my quality of life. So principle two is about great cities and neighborhoods being connected. Now principle three is about choices. In great cities, people have choices for getting around from place to place. Now here's an example of what this looks like and the way that buildings in fact need to be designed in order to accommodate walking and a whole variety of choices. You need to get the density right in order for all those different ways of moving to work in terms of your infrastructure. Now this next slide we like to call an anatomy of choice. And we call this an anatomy of choice because it's about recognizing that a great street is sort of a living, breathing thing. It has a cross section that is alive in different ways at different times of the day. In order to create places with options, it is essential to embrace complexity in the way we design our streets. Now, being of Dutch heritage, I would love it if movement of the future, in fact, looked like this. And now, you know, I have been schlepping around cities on my bike since I was carrying them up the mountain as a kid. And if we plan our cities right, this does in fact become a key way that we move from place to place. And you can appreciate how you need to bring the uses in close in order to make this a real viable way of moving. But it's more realistic to imagine that we're going to transition over time from the streets that we have, our auto-oriented design of streets, to more complete streets that can be designed in a variety of different ways that increase choice, because right now our choices tend to be pretty limited. So what might this look like? Well, complete streets can be configured in a whole variety of different ways. You can divide up that cross section to have a wide sidewalk, a bike, bike paths, a boulevard transit, as well as movement for cars. We can also accommodate, and this is an image from Portland, Oregon, light rail transit as a key and fundamental and central part of our corridors. We can also integrate buses and prioritizing buses and the movement of buses as prioritized along our streets as a better way to move people than prioritizing our streets for cars. We can also continue to ensure that we have lots of through access using our cars, but integrating a shared transit lane, a separate bike path, and a boulevard. There's a whole variety of ways that you can slice that infrastructure, that street infrastructure that exists in your city that can provide many more options for moving around. And if you do it right, you'll find that people will choose to move in different ways and this will in fact enhance quality of life. Several years ago, and I live in, in the center of the city of Toronto, several years ago, uh, I had this really sporty, sexy little mini 
that I love to drive. And several years ago, I, um, I decided to sell it. And I decided to sell it because I kept noticing that it was dusty. It was collecting dust in the driveway. And it was collecting dust because it wasn't my first choice. My first choice is usually my bike all summer long. I have the great option of cycling into work, which I do. My second choice is the TTC because it's fast and it's easy and it's very reliable. I can get onto the platform and I know it's there. Sometimes I use cabs. On the rare occasion that I'll, I'll drive, but I have lots of choices. And interestingly, living in an environment with those choices, my car was sort of coming in third. And I realized that it was just more of a burden and a real waste of money. And so I, in fact, got rid of it. When you create great choices, you can, in fact, increase quality of life through those different choices, which is difficult to imagine in a place where you only have one choice. And there are certain parts of Toronto or traveling in the region where, of course, you really want to have a car. There's not a lot of other good choices. Increasing choice is fundamental to great city building. So on to principle number four. Great cities bring a critical mix of uses in close. This principle is about capitalizing on the great value that density can add and ensuring that density is creating vibrancy 24-7, 24 hours of the day, seven days of the week. There are many places in our cities today where the infrastructure is underutilized most of the time. In those neighborhoods where we only live, well, that infrastructure is not getting used all day long, but the pipes are still aging. Sustainable development requires us to be using our infrastructure in better ways. And density, increased density, is one of the key one of the key tools and ways that we can, in fact, do this. It's also important to note that bringing density in close does not necessarily mean towers. In fact, some of the greatest cities in the world, the highest density cities in the world, have no tall buildings, like Paris. Washington, T.C. is a mid-rise city as well and a very dense city. Barcelona is a very dense city, one of the densest in the world, and it's a, a mid-rise city. So there's lots of different ways that we can accommodate density, higher density communities, using our infrastructure resources better while creating those complete communities that will make the Main Street work, will provide enough of a clientele that the Main Street businesses will, in fact, thrive. In some instances, Towers are the best way to create a high-density community, particularly this is a, uh, an example from the core of the city of the Toronto on our city place lands. Now, in some places of our cities, we need to look at ways that we can, in fact, transform existing infrastructure that we've underutilized by adding more density. Now, what you see here is a stretch of Eglinton where we are building 19 kilometers of light rail transit, the first light rail that we will in fact have in the city of Toronto. And the red boxes that you see here are the ways that we are anticipating we can accommodate higher density development along this corridor in order to integrate more density that will better utilize this transit investment infrastructure and build out the lower rise communities that exist adjacent to it. Now this idea of redeveloping corridors is a really important part of capitalizing on a profound investment that we've made over the past 30 years. You can see here a corridor in Toronto and this is an example of this, how this corridor uh, can in fact transform over time by beginning to build mid-rise buildings right up to the edge of the street, then beginning to add pedestrian-oriented infrastructure along the edge of the street, adding more density, more animation at the street level, more shops, more uses will bring in more pedestrians. This is another example of how we can transform a street. Now, you can probably think of a lot of areas in Hamilton that look just like this. I can, and in fact, you can go all over 
uh, all over Ontario and really all over North America and see instances like this, just think about the investment we've made in this street. The sidewalks, the piping, the asphalt. We've spent a tremendous amount of money in places that in fact haven't generated any long-term value. Well, how can we capitalize on that value? We can do it by adding densities that will create great places, bringing in new development to the edge of the street, adding uh, more mid-rise development, widening our sidewalks, bringing in uses that add animation, and in this instance, adding light rail transit. A very important part of our objective in the City of Toronto is to use the infrastructure we already have better. And I believe it's a fiscal imperative to in fact do so. Part of this is about creating mid-rise development on our existing corridors. You have a tremendous land area in Hamilton and the opportunity to take those underutilized corridor and to build them out with new housing for forms and types is a grand opportunity. Now, density is an important part of great, creating great cities, but if you don't get the design right, you'll have a problem on your hands. In great cities, design matters. Great density, St. Jamestown, Toronto, wrong design. Wrong design, wrong density. Very, very expensive infrastructure to build given the per capita usage. Now here we have great design and great density utilizing existing infrastructure. But those are just examples of housing. Great cities also have great public realms, the spaces that we share in common. And the quality of our public realms says something about what it is that we value. It is a way that we make contributions to civic life. We add inspiration, how we design our public spaces, our public art installations. And we also signal who it is that belongs in our city and belongs in our public spaces. So in great cities, design matters. Now my next principle is about heritage preservation and restoration being recognized as adding long-term value. Now, I was surprised to learn earlier today that you, in fact, have no heritage conservation districts in the city of Hamilton. I think this is a shame, and I think it is a profound opportunity, in part because we know that protecting our heritage infrastructure is about creating distinct walkable districts and places. Heritage preservation adds to the identity of a city. It defines who you are, and it can be a key driver of economic development. The stores in this image, uh, in this next image, are called the Five Thieves. They're called the Five Thieves because they are so upscale that they, in fact, rob you blind. Don't buy your bread here. In part, the uniqueness of the heritage buildings in this area has created an asset. It has, in fact, driven up land values. But in great cities, heritage places are also being adapted for innovative uses. You have some examples of this, heritage buildings that have become affordable housing in your city. This is an image of the Brickworks in Toronto, one of my favorite places to go. Uh, we bike down here with my kids on Mother's Day. It's always my request. This is where all the bricks were built, and the original brick ovens are still in place, where the bricks were made to build much of the housing that exists in the city of Toronto. It's now an urban park. It's an event space. And this is also now a think tank for urban sustainability. As Jane Jacobs says, new ideas need old buildings. But new buildings can also be utilized to revitalize old buildings, as was the case with the National Ballet School you see here on Jarvis Street, where the old buildings and the new buildings have a very important 
relationship to one another. Now, my next principle doesn't need too much explanation. It's pretty straightforward, maybe the most straightforward of all of the principles I'm going to share, and it is this. Great cities value clean land, air, and water. And this may sound intuitive, but we've really struggled with this, haven't we? Our cities increasingly are our habitats. They sustain us. We know, and this may seem counterintuitive, but the denser our habitat and the extent to which we create those transportation choices, the lower our ecological footprint. The American city where residents have the lowest ecological footprint or environmental footprint on a per capita ba basis in America is, in fact, New York City. Why? Because so much of our environmental footprint is generated by how we move around. And how do New Yorkers move around? They walk, they take the subway, they cycle. They also take many, many cabs as well. <clears throat> Without our habitat that sustains us, let's face it, we don't have life. This is, uh, you know, this is not a frivolous concern. <laughs> this is essential. Clean air, land, and water is essential to a great city. It's not ancillary. It needs to be at the heart of how we think about the places that we create in order to live in. And great cities remember this and treat land, air, and water all as a precious, precious resource that is not to be squandered. And lastly, principle number eight is that great cities plan for affordable housing. If you do the rest of this right, my other principles right, you'll have an affordable housing problem. If you create a great place and you begin to attract an enormous number of people into your city, affordable housing will increasingly become a problem, even more so than it may already be today. And this is really the catch-22 for cities, because the extent to which you are affordable today is something that is in fact going to disappear as you move forward on your ambitious city mandate. But you have a wonderful opportunity to pause now and to think carefully about how you will ensure that your city is in fact a place that is for all. You can see here a slide of the Regent Park redevelopment. This is one of the largest uh, uh, affordable uh, social housing redevelopments uh, in Canada and it is replacing a 1960s tower in the park disaster and doing so by creating a mixed-use community, market housing, affordable housing, social housing, all combined in one redevelopment. This is 60 Richmond, which is another wonderful example of a singular building that is an affordable housing project right in the heart, right in the core of downtown Toronto. We need innovative solutions to address affordable housing because often our transportation problems, our movement problems, are affordable housing problems. People are choosing to live very far away from where they work, in part because they can't afford to live close to where they work. So great cities consider affordable housing and integrate it into their long-term planning in a truly substantive way. So I'm now going to shift my presentation a little bit and take some liberties here. As I said, I'm, you know, I'm feeling I'm amongst family tonight. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've called some hard truths for Hamilton. Now, some of you in the room, I know, have been grappling with these hard truths for many years. And uh, I might be stating the obvious with some of them. But I le believe they need to be said. It's important to stop in this moment in time because you are an ambitious city. And in order to be a truly transformed city, you need to understand where you're at, your starting point. What's your existing condition? And so these hard truths are about considering very carefully where you're at today. 
and I'm almost feeling a bit nervous about putting this up on the screen. <laughs> I'm, I'm losing all my courage suddenly. <laughs> But I have a PowerPoint, so I'm a bit stuck, so I'm going to have to plow on. So you're going to get the hard truths. And the first is this, the bravery's back. I'm gonna put that bike on my shoulder and march up that mountain. It's this, you've made some classic mistakes. And these are classic mistakes because you are a product of your time. You made mistakes that others made as well. And they've really hurt you dearly. You need to figure out how to fix some of these mistakes. You've made your streets for cars. And as a result, your downtown has suffered from a long period of being a great place to drive through, but not much of a place to be. And those two things are in conflict. Great cities where you can drive with ease, they don't really exist. Great cities are usually not very good places to drive because they're a place to go to where you park the car and you get out or you arrive on transit. They're not places that you simply move through and you're going to need to make a choice. Will your downtown be a place that you move through or will it be a destination, a place that you go to? And that is a very difficult struggle because it means bringing together various interests that are often in conflict, but you're going to need to negotiate this tension. You also have, and this is a photo from 1954, this is your downtown, you've taken down an inconceivable amount of heritage stock. This is a classic mistake. The red is what has disappeared since 1954. What's uh, sort of heartbreaking about this is that, of course, um, there was lots of good stuff that disappeared. You uh, took away some street connections, and street connections are really important, both for pedestrian connectivity, but moving people through, keeping environments safe, having a really strong grid, you had it. Uh, I think uh, Jackson Square is up in the, in the top right of this, of this image. And this was a classic mistake. Another classic mistake, of course, was Jackson Square, which internalized retail, turned its back on the downtown, created unsafe places, places where people don't linger or collect. But you have also, you sort of have a classic worst offense. And I'm going to show you the classic worst offense, and it's this you've continued to grow out, and you're still continuing to grow out today, as opposed to growing in. And this is a classic offense. I've called them classic because lots of other people have done them too. You really haven't planned any differently than the municipalities around you. The municipalities around you are sprawling indefinitely. And you have, in fact, built very, very costly infrastructure on the edges of your city, and that infrastructure will continue to decline over time. And your challenge is to figure out how to create infrastructure that will add value over time. I was on a panel last night with Richard Florida, and we were, he's, he said to me that infrastructure investment always drives growth. And I said, well, not really. Because one of the things that we learned with the crash of 2009 south of the border, which really it was a mortgaging problem, and it was a banking problem, and it was a financial problem, but it was a suburban problem. It was a housing form that couldn't be afforded by the average person that was buying that housing form. And municipalities couldn't afford to continue to maintain the roads because it was a very expensive form of infrastructure because on a per capita basis, very few people were using that infrastructure. But alas, I have some good news. These classic mistakes are, in fact, fixable. These classic mistakes are all fixable, and many cities around the world are currently engaged in fixing them. I know, because in Toronto, we made many of these classic mistakes too, many of them. In fact, there are many parts of Toronto that are more like Hamilton, that are dissimilar from Hamilton, because we are primarily a suburban city as well. 
So some examples of ways that we are transforming streets. Here's an example of a street that looked like this. I'll just show you that again. And the photo was taken from almost the same, same location. A street that looked like this, streets for cars, that has been transformed, this is Sherburne, to look like this. We also have streets that look like this. This probably looks familiar to you. Many parts of Hamilton look like this. This is the Golden Mile along Eglinton Avenue in Scarborough. Very, very large amount of infrastructure here. And this is part of where we're introdu introducing uh, light rail infrastructure. And you can see here the uh, light rail transit is going to go right down the center of the corridor. And we're also going to transform this infrastructure by adding separated cycling infrastructure, but we know that we need to change the dynamic on the streets and add widened sidewalks and green the streets to make them complete streets, corridors that will be desirable to walk. But of course, you can see what's now missing from this picture. Think about those, those principles for great city building. We're missing the density. We're missing the uses and the buildings that come up close to the edge of the street. So we have just put the planning policy, we're in the process of putting the planning policy in place in order to transform this streetscape, to fix it, to turn it into what it should be, a place that adds value and creates a sustainable, walkable community. Uh, another example, this is a, uh, in Etobicoke, this is a suburban strip mall for lack of a better way of putting it. You can kind of see in the dotted areas, the area that I'm talking about, we have low rise residential suburban housing, housing uh, a, a mall with a lot of surface parking, and we're transforming this to better use the infrastructure and to create a walking destination within an existing low rise neighborhood by adding density that will be a counterpoint to the low density community. So this is what the proposal for moving forward currently looks like in this community. Using the investment we've made in infrastructure to create complete communities and complete streets where you can do all those things that we do every day within walking distance of home. So that was only my first hard truth. I've got more. So uh, that was, uh, I thought I'd war warm you up with a, with a real doozy. The second one is this, you must in fact invest differently. If you want to grow and attract that precious, precious 19 to 34 year old cohort, which is the largest demographic in the city and really represents the future of your labor force in any city, it is imperative that you invest in the infrastructure that appeals to this demographic, that's actually going to attract this demographic. Now, uh, we're actually doing a pretty good job of this in downtown Toronto. It's the uh, fastest growing city in North America. Our downtown is where 44% of our growth is going. And who's moving there? It's 19 to 34 year olds. And guess what? They don't have driver's licenses. They don't own cars. And they're moving into the downtown core because they want to be able to walk to work. They want to be able to bike to work or bike to visit friends. And they want to take transit more frequently. Mowing the lawn on Saturday morning, mm, it's out. It's not cool with this cohort. But strolling in the park, such as H2O on Toronto's waterfront, to watch the world go by, to meet up with friends, or to work in a nearby cafe, that's very cool. That's really in. So from a city planning perspective, knowing that we want to plan for the future and we want to attract this very important demographic, it's imperative that we invest in complete streets with cycling lanes and a beautiful public realm in order to create the places that add value and attract this important demographic. Ensuring affordable housing is available in the core of the city is essential too, and it's a real risk, and we have this challenge in downtown Toronto right now, although at our last council meeting, we did approve a waterfront project, and 20% 20 20 of that project is going to be affordable housing, a wonderful achievement, but we do have this risk that we have to manage and ensure we continue to plan for affordable housing. So that is my 
Second hard truth is that you're going to have to invest in infrastructure in a very different way than you've invested in the past. Now, my third hard truth is that city building is difficult and it demands tenacity. And I know that it has been difficult. And I've met many passionate urbanists over the years in the downtown. I had dinner with some of them tonight at conferences and at events who are working very, very hard in order to transform this city to be a great city. But the reality is leadership will be required from all sectors. This isn't a job just for planners, we need planners, or just politicians, but we need politicians at the table too. It is essential that we widen the tent, that we bring more people in to the table to identify as and participate in city building. Remember our shared interest? Prosperity for all. This is a task that will require your business community, universities, colleges, McMaster, Mohawk, your artists, your growing artist community, your community activists, your residence associations, your bold thinkers need a seat at the table. It's not enough to generate great plans. It is imperative to build capacity for engagement to build constituencies for ideas, places where conversations take place and learning grows, such that you can experiment and try new things and do things in a way that is fundamentally different from how you've done them in the past. It is imperative to engage in a deep and broad and continued conversation about the city and about what you want to become and how you plan to share the resources that you have in common and to continue having conversations about what it is that you will share in common and what the basis for your future will be moving forward. You know what I'm talking about, that shared vision. You need to continually have conversations about your shared vision in order to nurture it, maintain it, and keep it alive. You will need to draw as many people as possible into the conversation in order to grow your capacity as city builders in the city of Hamilton. Now, I know a little bit about this because I have the same challenge in the city of Toronto, but it's on a bigger scale, of course, because uh, Toronto is 2.7 million people. But through a series of initiatives, I've been trying to stimulate these conversations and in unbelievably amazing thing has happened and it's this whenever I've opened the door for the conversation and created access people show up people want to be a part of this vision I suspect many of you in the room today want to be a part of the future of this city you want to be a part of its ambition and that's why you're here well, there's things that you can do to facilitate opening up this conversation about city building and building capacity for change. Uh, this is an image from an initiative we launched this summer. We paired up with Lego. Lego was our sponsor. And we, in fact, held an initiative called Planners in Public Space. And we went out to the spaces where people are in the city of Toronto, all over the city, over the summer months. Planners went out to have conversations about city building because we recognize the greatest challenge that we have is that we can hold a public meeting and a few people will show up, sometimes lots and lots, hundreds of people will show up, but there's many people who will never show up, who will never see the connection between what it is we do at City Hall, the work we do every day, and how you create a great city. And the reality is we'll never, ever shift the way we invest or shift the way we plan unless we build understandings for those timeless principles in city building that are essential to creating great cities. I also hosted something called Chief Planner Roundtables. I held three at the beginning of 2013 and I've just concluded holding a series of three more. And part of what I've tried to do in the context of these roundtables is to bring in experts from a variety of different sectors 
for a cross-disciplinary conversation about the greatest challenges that face us. One of them was building a resilient city. How do you plan a city in face of climate change? One of them was about how do we invest in our public realm? We have no money. How do we do it? How do we build better public spaces? But the last three that I just told were about our suburbs, understanding our suburbs, understanding how to make them more sustainable, how to transform them, transform them other, over time, but also understanding the great needs that exist in our suburbs, as well as the great transportation issues around moving about and congestion that exists in our suburbs. What's interesting about these roundtables is that I just kind of tried it as an experiment, said, you know what? We don't have these conversations. It's essential that we do. I would like to learn from people across this city. And when we posted the first round table, we posted it online and we said, you need to reserve a ticket because we only had 200 seats in the committee room. Within 24 hours, all the seats were gone. So we decided to run it on Rogers, uh, live stream it, and we created an overflow room. And the response has been absolutely astounding. There are so many people who care passionately about our cities and our communities in Canada. And I believe that we need to find new ways to draw people into our conversations. And this is another example of how I've been experimenting in doing this. And it's called Toronto Talks Transportation. Now, I'm actually very, very proud of this headline. I don't know if you can read it. But it says, Sun Reporter gets an understanding of cyclists. But in fact, if you could read the, you read the small print, you would say that the reporter begins the article by saying, I used to hate cyclists. We did a consultation process on bikes. And we took people out into the community to look at our cycling infrastructure and to talk about our cycling infrastructure, not as something that radicals do, and not as something that you only do on a Sunday morning as recreation, but to understand cycling as part of our transportation infrastructure. And this article really captures the objective of consultation and broad participation. It's about changing minds. It's about learning. It's about beginning to see the city through a different lens. And this reporter, she's shown in the photograph with me, she came on this consultation. She took one of the Bixie bikes because she didn't have a bike. She cycled in the downtown, and it fundamentally shifted her understanding of cycling in the city. I believe this is our great hope. This is our great opportunity. Because we can have conversations that generate learning about those timeless principles in city building. Hamilton, I would like to suggest that the future is, in fact, very, very bright. And I'd like to suggest that it's bright because it's in your hands. You choose the city that you want to become. You choose whether this will be a city for all or a city for just some. You choose whether you will have a sustainable future or whether you'll ruin your habitat. You choose how you will invest your precious public dollars in infrastructure that is an investment in long-term placemaking, creating and designing great places, or you might invest your money in quick, short-term hits that are going to cost you over the long run. You choose whether your city will become a place of distinction where you recognize and protect and leverage your heritage buildings or whether you just kind of clear them away for something easier, for something new. You choose as a city economic prosperity. You choose it by creating the places that will attract that coveted 18 to 34 year old cohort that we all know is the basis of our future economy. You get to choose your future, Hamilton. Hamilton, be an ambitious city. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to invite you right back on up here, and we're going to have a conversation now. Now, on, on all of your tables, there are question cards. 
So please, while we have a conversation up here, please do fill them out. If you do have any questions, we'll be collecting them as we, as we speak up here, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be addressing them as we receive them. So Jennifer, I'm gonna welcome you back to the stage. So I had all kinds of questions here. I had like tons of questions for you. And after watching that, you pretty much answered all of them. So I've gone back and I've rewritten my questions. And I don't want to ask about complete streets. I don't want to ask about the stuff that we hear so many people come to Hamilton and tell us. Because if, if people are interested in city building, if, and a lot of people, I know a lot of people in the room have been in this room so many times that we've heard the same things so often about, you know, it's important to have public transit and that sort of thing. So you're someone who's executing this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask now how, how we do that. So I have, I have a few questions for you here, and we're going to see, see just how we do this. <laughs> First of all, I have to ask, though, Coming from Hamilton, how did you become such an urbanist? How did you become, as I've seen described in, in a few places, the rock star of urbanism and city planning? Well, that's an interesting question. And, um, and I've been thinking about that a lot over the past few weeks in, in anticipating this presentation tonight. And it's really interesting. It was really interesting for me to realize all of the different touch points in the city, in the region, that played a role in shaping who I am. And one of the things that may have come through in my opening comments, but I didn't make it explicit, is that I did, I spend a lot of time getting around from place to place. And Hamilton can be a pretty hard city to get around from place to place. Yeah. Um, you know, I was being quite literal when I talked about putting my bike on my shoulder and hoofing it up the mountain because I did that. Um, but, you know, I had a hard time moving around this, uh, moving around this city. And after I lived here, I moved to uh, London, where I went to Western. And when I lived at Western, I pretty much lived on campus the entire time. And I think that started to shape my worldview because I had this very contained world. But then I moved to Vancouver. And when I got to Vancouver, that was when kind of the wheels came off and I started to see the potential for living in a fundamentally different way. And I also started to become interested in a whole variety of issues that city planners are, are engaged in, like affordable housing and like the links between sustainability and how you move about in a, in a city. And it was in Vancouver that I really started uh, riding a bike as a form of commuting um, in a really substantial way. I kind of picked up that thread from my high school years uh, so I think that there's a variety of different experiences that all contributed a little piece of the puzzle to my thinking. And I, I, read, I read somewhere actually that it was in Vancouver that you were, you were at a party or somewhere and, and someone said, wow, you talk like a city planner. And your response was, what's a city planner? <laughs> That's from, absolutely true. From there, then you went on to, to study this and, and lead, our, lead our largest city, which is quite something to go from a party. Well, that's absolutely true. And uh, the person responded me, to me and said, what, you don't know what city planning is? And I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> and uh, this person suggested that I go read Jane Jacobs' book, The Life and Death of Great American Cities. And so I did. I went home, I got the book, I read the book, and that was really the beginning of realizing that I'd found my home and I had, in fact, found my passion. So looking at, looking at city planning all through history and, and looking at Hamilton right now, uh, city planning has not always been about people, or has it? Because looking at the, the images that you put up on the screen just now and seeing these beautiful lush walkways and quick uh, you know, ways to get around your city, um, we have a lot of architecture here in Hamilton, which was planned, um, but it's not very interactive with the street, like Jackson Square. Mm -hmm. So how did that happen? When did the shift suddenly go, gee, we need to look after the people and maybe not after the cars or after the businesses? or? No, I blame the engineers. <laughs> that's, not, that's not totally true, but it's a little bit true. Um, <laughs> there, like any other discipline, there have been different waves of thought and, and different approaches. And I think that what's, what's really strange, and I think you know, this is sort of a hard truth for Hamilton, is that Hamilton is actually building out on your edges the type of thing that you're building out um, is the type of uh, development that has been abandoned in other places because it's already known to cause long-term congestion and to be very expensive infrastructure to maintain over the long term. 
So the catch-22 is that these different schools of thought have been layered. So for example, people like to think that in Portland, Oregon, those West Coast folks, they just like to cycle. But that's actually not true. In the 1970s, uh, the, there was a, an expressway proposed to go right through the heart of downtown Portland. And the community got together and decided they really didn't want this expressway. And a few people lobbied that the money that was going to go through the expressway should instead be used in cycling lanes. And as a result, they created a cycling plan and have spent the past 30 years implementing this plan and really building a tremendous amount of community consensus around the importance of environmental sustainability and the importance of cycling as a key part of transportation infrastructure. And that has led to a fundamentally different way to plan a city. Well, all of that was happening in Portland, where, well, at the same time, in the GTA, we were, in fact, building, uh, you know, it's no coincidence that we have the worst congestion in North America. It's in the GTA. It's worse than LA. It's just unbelievable. Uh, the average commute time in Toronto is 45, 45 minutes one way, which means an hour and a half each day. Uh, people are spending commuting. And I just saw some data on Hamilton, and the numbers aren't so great for Hamilton either. No. 45, 85% of Hamiltonians commute using a car, um, and the commute times are also, they're, they're, and they're only going to, as you continue to sprawl, this is a catch-22, the commute times only get longer and longer. It's a no-win situation. The infrastructure gets more expensive, and the commute times just keep getting longer and longer. Well, we've known this for 30 years, yeah. and yet we're still building it. Yeah, and, we've, and we, we have a real donut around the city here, actually, and, and density's now coming back downtown. We have a bit of a condo, and I've been told not to say boom, because boom's bust, but uh, <laughs> we have a bit of a condo coming up right now, which is uh, seeing density <laughs> come back into the city. Just not saying boom, but we say boom. So I love, I, I found a quote on your, um, on your blog, and this is, this is a fantastic quote, and it's a quote from Charles Montgomery. Yeah, it was written actually in the Atlantic originally, and you reposted and, and uh, you said, or no, actually, sorry, on Twitter, uh, about Denmark and how they restricted banks opening new branches yeah. uh, on, on downtown main shopping streets. So this is the quote. Quote, it is not that the Danes hate the banks. It is that passive bank facades bleed life from the sidewalk, and too many of them can kill a street. It is that the citizens, citizenry's right to a healthy, life-giving public realm has trumped everyone's right to kill it. Now we have a lot of banks downtown and, and that's okay, but the approach here, I mean, here in Hamilton, here in North America, we might consider that radical. Like, you can't open a bank branch downtown because it's gonna kill your street? Well, we can't actually do that based on our, our planning policy. Like, yeah. we, we can't regulate, you, we can't, can't regulate the users. We can regulate the uses as per the Ontario Planning Act. But the point or the idea in that quote is a very important one, which is that the way you design the street determines whether it's safe or not safe. And in that same piece, uh, Charles Montgomery actually talks about how senior citizens who live within close proximity of uh, amenities that they can walk to, they have less um, they have less issues with depression, they're more connected to their community, they have stronger bodies, they have less health issues. There's just all these incredible spin-offs that come from creating really great walkable communities. The thing that we can do, and this is where heritage conservation districts become a really important tool, is that in the context of a heritage conservation district, we can actually regulate the frequency of doors and windows and awnings in order to create that street level vibrancy that's at a pedestrian scale. And, and, and that's, that's really the thing, it's really not about, it's not about banks, it's about the design. And this is yes. something I wanted to ask kind of as a follow up to that then. So do the people create the environment? Does the environment create the people? And how, how symbiotic is that relationship? Well, you've got to read uh, Charles Montgomery's book. It's called The Happy City. But uh, it, you know, it's, I think it absolutely goes both ways. We know that when you have amenities within walking distance, for example, people are more likely to know their neighbors. And I love telling this story because I've worked in mid-sized Canadian cities across Canada, and people are always amazed in Regina or Halifax to discover that I know all my neighbors on my street in Toronto and wouldn't hesitate to go next door to borrow a cup of sugar or to ask someone to watch my kid for a few hours 
on my street in the heart of Toronto. Well, why is that? It's because we're very close to the subway. And when we first moved into our neighborhood, I was really surprised because on Monday morning, as I was walking to the subway, I realized that everyone's cars, all the, their cars were in their driveway because everyone else was walking to the subway too. So you see people on the street, you have a, a sense of place, a relationship to your neighborhood, and that affects the way you feel about your community. It affects your sense of safety, but it also affects the amount of responsibility that you take for your community as well. If you're always just getting in your car and driving away and driving back, you don't actually have a sense of ownership of your neighborhood as something that needs to be protected or enhanced or valued in some way. One of the stories I love telling is uh, Valentine's Day is really funny in my neighborhood because uh, we make a reservation at a local restaurant because we have a ton of them within walking distance and it's, it's all these couples walking down the street everywhere. Everyone's walking to the various restaurants. So Valentine's Day ends up being sort of this very social, social evening for us because we're like, oh, there's so-and-so, oh, there's so-and-so, and we're all in pairs and we kind of hook up and, you know, chat on the sidewalk in the community. street. It's a community, yeah. which we wouldn't get if we lived in a community where we were getting in our car and driving somewhere. A driveway to driveway experience, yeah. <clears throat> Got a question now from uh, from the audience here. So this and this relates very directly to that. Uh, you mentioned that downtowns need to be places to go. So can you elaborate why people in the suburbs should care about our downtowns? Ooh, <clears throat> uh, I think there's an inherent flaw in the question, um, in part because uh, it assumes that people in the suburbs don't necessarily have an interest in the downtown and. If your downtown is your employment center, then typically you see a migration into the downtown because it is in fact where people work. Mm. And I always, I really struggle with this in Toronto because we have these debates all the time, the suburban urban, am I suburban or am I urban? Yeah. And we generally don't really divide up into those categories very well, in part because we cross those boundaries and people who might live in the suburbs might work in the downtown. If you plan your downtown, your center very well, it will have your strongest civic presence. It will be your seat of government, which yours is. You have all of the, you have all the critical mass in your downtown for it to success, which I think is why urbanists have been quite fascinated with Hamilton and why it hasn't seen more growth. You've also got uh, cultural facilities like the art gallery right in the core of the downtown. So having those entertainment facilities um, but also having your shopping destinations in the downtown is a very important part of adding animation. So when you create the downtown as a true center, it becomes a center for all. Mm -hmm. It's a place where everyone looks for that critical mass of activity to take place where you know you can go and you can stroll the street and you can do a whole variety of different things. The challenge that you have in Hamilton is that you don't, you're not quite there in terms of the amount of activity that you have taking place in your downtown. So it isn't a place that a lot of people probably need to go to. There's no reason to go to. And this is a trick in city planning. In order to make your downtown work, you have to be really disciplined about your other uses in the city. You can't kind of be, be growing outwards and pulling uses outwards and at the same time be cre creating critical mass in the core. And I recall having a conversation, it might have been with Glenn at the downtown summit. We had a conversation several years ago about how Hamilton's doing all the right things. You've got the facade improvement programs, heritage studies, looking at changing the, the, the one-way streets to two-way streets. Why isn't it Hamilton's moment? Why isn't it happening yet? And I think it's because it's not, it's not a problem with what you're doing in the downtown. It's a problem with the energy is still moving outwards at the edges of the city and finding a way to contain that and drive the growth in is how you're going to begin to create that animation that you see in a larger city, in a larger urban center. So that, that actually leads really well to another uh, two questions actually that are asking similar things here. Uh, one of them is, uh, points out the fact that our downtown renewal, uh, maybe claims that our downtown renewal is, is in large part being driven by Toronto or the proximity to Toronto and I, I can say my wife works in Toronto, I work here. so. And that's, that's a very common story here in, in Hamilton. People that are migrating as a result of Toronto being unaffordable, uh, or people are migrating rather as a result of Toronto being unaffordable, so how is this sustainable without the jobs then in Hamilton if we always still have to go back to Toronto 
And then kind of as a, as a second to that, how do we attract that demographic to our downtown? So there's a lot of questions in there. Um, yeah, it's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll start with the first one, which is um, I think it's wonderful that Hamilton is seen as an affordable option if you, in fact, also have the jobs because you don't simply want to be a place for living, in part because it doesn't create a very high quality of life mm -hmm. if you're spending a huge amount of your time commuting from one city to the next. Even with high-speed supersonic transit between Hamilton and Toronto, mm, you're still going to be spending a good hour and a half each way getting from door, to, from door to door. It's never, ever going to, it's always going to be a long commute. So the trick, and you have some real advantages in Hamilton with respect to this, is to figure out how you, in fact, develop uh, a very local and unique niche economy. And it's already happening around your arts and culture scene. Your university, McMaster, is going to be a very important player and incubator for driving forward uh, the ways that you can explore creative industries. Interestingly, New York City, after 2009, uh, was very concerned about this issue. Like New York City, city of 12 million pe people, was actually concerned because the financial sector, so many jobs were lost. And the concern was that they were losing a substantive portion of their employment base uh, in Manhattan. And so the university held an international design competition to create a high-tech campus. And it was all about high-tech jobs and creating innovation in the tech industry. And this was the Bloomberg Initiative. And this has been a wild success in acting as an incubator to generate new jobs in New York City. And in part, it was about diversifying the economy in Manhattan because it was too much of a financial center. Uh, but it was also about looking to the future and looking what employment might look like in the future. And you, you have a lot of manufacturing in the city. That's a good thing, figuring out how to capitalize and create secondary industries from the manufacturing that already exists here, I think that's an enormous opportunity for Hamilton. Um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of the things that you're doing already are building a critical mass, like you're doing a lot of the things you need to do, you just haven't hit the tipping point yet. Mm. And it's going to take a bit more energy and a bit more tenacity in order to hit that tipping point. And at that point then, that demographic is naturally just perhaps by osmosis, pulled into the downtown and becomes that much more feasible? Well, only if you create the kinds of places that are going to attract that demographic. Um, people who are coming to live in downtown Toronto in what to you may might seem like a very tiny little shoebox of a unit um, are coming for the quality of life. Mm. They're coming to be close to shops, restaurant, entertainment, a diverse population, access to great, great transit. So diversifying your housing type, if the majority of your new builds are suburban development, and I know you've got some condos being developed, but uh, I had a friend of mine pull some stats uh, on this. The majority of units are still the traditional single family dwelling. Yeah. The reality is that 18 to 34 year old co cohort, guess what? It's not mom and dad and two kids. It's, you know, our families look very different and more and more people are living alone. So you will never get that demographic if you don't build the housing type that is going to accommodate the quality of life needs. So even if you have the jobs, you could find yourself in the awkward situation where people are choosing not to live here, but they might come in for the work and leave. And building complete communities where people can choose to live where they work is a real fundamental part of uh, creating sustainable cities, addressing our movement challenges, and also attracting that demographic. So if we keep sprawling in Hamilton, uh, economics would say logically that's driven by the market demand. So... No, that's not true why, at all. Why do we keep sprawling? What is it that propels that continual outward growth? Well, I won't... Um, it's probably policy. It's probably land use policy. Because, you know, what changed it in Toronto was land use policy. Um, the Places to Grow Act and the Greenbelt Plan suddenly took away the ability of the GTA north of Toronto to continue to sprawl. And so strong planning policy resulted in uh, a significant and fundamental shift in the market. The market changed on a dime. So it's, it's not demand, it's the market. The other is, um, and I don't know because I haven't looked at Hamilton, but I suspect that you're actually subsidizing that infrastructure. You're probably subsidizing it more than you're subsidizing affordable housing. 
uh, because you're paying the infrastructure costs and you're paying likely to maintain the infrastructure over time. So snow plowing those streets is extremely expensive uh, when you have a very low density. So looking at your financial policy is a fundamental part of shifting your land use forms. And there's a wonderful book by an American scholar and it's called Zoned Out. And he basically did really detailed analysis. It'll be boring, I'll just summarize it for you. Uh, it's interesting for people like me. He did really detailed analysis and looked at this myth that the market is driving our land use forms and essentially demonstrated that it's municipal finance policy which essentially subsidizes suburban sprawl and makes it more expensive to build redevelopment in the core of a city that was actually creating that land use form, that it wasn't market demand at all, it was actually affordability. And the reason that that housing form is affordable is because it's subsidized. So how, uh, we have a few questions actually about affordable housing. So uh, one of the questions is regarding affordable housing, how do we best fight back against nimbyism? The idea that while you know, this neighborhood should all be of this certain, you know, economic stratus. How do you, how do you, how do you integrate people of different economic means in a downtown area? How do you fight against NIMBYism? So that's really tricky. Let me just say that straight off the bat, because it's not an easy thing to do. And, um, and I don't want to pretend that it's ever, ever easy. But we do have a really great example in the Regent Park redevelopment that's taken place in Toronto in part because Regent Park uh, has historically been synonymous with crime and drug use in a low-income community. And now you can, in fact, buy a pretty expensive penthouse in Regent Park because it became a mixed-use community. And I believe part of this is about our model. And it's the reason why I also showed 60 Richmond, that kind of funky affordable housing building because when we integrate affordable housing into communities in a very sensitive way, I think that we um, build capacity to understand that it's not, something that's, it's not something that's frightening. The challenge is our old model of a developing affordable housing has been the old Regent Park model, massive areas that very quickly become ghettoized. So, and uh, Vancouver is actually doing an even better job than we are of doing this um, in Ontario. Vancouver is building, you know, 30 unit buildings or 20 unit buildings just on a main street and you would never know that it's, that it's uh, subsidized housing and next door there's a very expensive condo because it's a fully mixed use approach and a mixed use community. The challenge is until you have some of those examples, it sort of becomes difficult to imagine what that looks like. So I think you have to find examples from elsewhere, have those conversations in order to build capacity. But I don't, I don't want to pretend that that's an easy thing to do. Once you do have those examples, so you've had a lot of long conversations, once you ha do have those examples, then, it, then you hit a tipping point and it becomes very easy. And I think in some places in Toronto, that's the, the, the moment we're at right now where it's actually very easy to integrate because people have seen it done, they've seen it done well, they've seen that it doesn't have a negative impact on their neighborhood, and in principle, I think most people you know, they're concerned about their self-interest. Is it going to affect my, my safety? Is this going to affect my house values? And when people see, oh, this doesn't affect my safety, and oh, this doesn't affect my property values, then I think most people are, are willing to say, oh, this, is, this isn't a bad thing at all. This is a good thing. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. And so, so that kind of also begs the question then, leading on to another one here, uh, who is, who is the, the impetus for change incumbent on? Is it, is it the government? Is it private interest? I mean, when it comes to social housing or affordable housing, Typically, the government is, the, is the, the financial backer of a lot of that sort of stuff. But this another question here as well was what comes first, the complete streets or the businesses? So is it the public sector or the private sector that has to step up first? And I know in Hamilton, we sometimes have a bit of a standoff between the two. Who's going to, who's going to, and, and oh, well, once they did, now I will. But how do you see that, that relationship between public and private? Well, I have a pretty strong um, opinion on that. <laughs> Uh, and it's this, that it's imperative for the public sector to lead. And the public sector needs to lead and instill confidence and demonstrate that they're committed to the future of the city. And as long as the public sector isn't willing to lead, why would the private, why would the private follow? And in every instance where we've used this model, it's been really successful. The waterfront, Waterfront Toronto, 
The public sector has been leading by investing in great quality public spaces as a way of getting the private sector to come in and spend a lot of money remediating those pretty awful brown brownfield sites and turning them into housing and turning them into new uses. Uh, with respect to affordable housing, the catch-22 is that um, the market just can't provide affordable housing. There's very few examples where you have subsidized housing where you've created some kind of public-private partnership where it's, where it's actually worked. Regent Park is a um, public-private partnership model, but it still had federal and provincial dollars in order for it to move forward. Lauren Heights, Lawrence Heights is another large-scale redevelopment project we're engaging in in Toronto. Uh, we need $40 million of city money in order to make to make the, the to balance the books to make it work. It's very very difficult um, not to have some type of government funding or subsidy. And uh, I challenge anyone in this room to show me a model that's different. And I've been doing this challenge for a while now, and I haven't had anyone who's come up to me and shown me an example that didn't involve monies from the federal, the provincial government. We need those orders of government to play a really key role in developing affordable housing. We're going to move quickly. We have a whole lot of stuff here and a lot of questions. I'm trying to kind of connect them with each other to make this uh, expedient here. Moving from that, obviously, to then get the public sector to, to take the initiative, the question here is vision. How do we encourage our elected officials to, to build their vision? And I wanted to tie that in with something else that I found actually on, uh, on actually in your TEDx talk at York University, you had said three success factors, and this I think plays very quickly into, um, into, into vision from, the, from people and also from elected officials. One, you said the need to believe, and that's optimism. Believing that you can actually do something, and I think the example you gave was we can put a man on the moon. When at the beginning of the century, uh, we hadn't really figured out internal combustion. Uh, two, the need to understand informed conversations with the public. We need to under, the public needs to understand City Hall, and City Hall needs to understand the public. And number three, the need to engage belief and understanding grow through engagement. So how is it then that the general people in this room, in the city beyond these walls, how do we connect with people like yourself, with our, uh, with our staff and our, our elected officials at City Hall to actually accomplish all of this amazing stuff? Well, I think you just gave everyone the answer. It's those three things. <laughs> um, but I, I really do believe that. If the, if the first piece is that you need to believe. You need to have, have a vision and recognize that you can be a part of the change that you'd like to, that you'd like to see. Um, but you also need to understand, because belief without understanding is, uh, you know, that's when you think someone's a, a, on a tangent or a rant, it's like, oh. They really believe it, but I'm not buying into it because they really don't understand what they're talking about. So you need to increase your capacity to participate in city building conversations. And then the third idea, engaging, is really about once you have that belief, and I think we probably have some believers in the room today, once you've built your understanding, and that's something that's an ongoing process, you need to figure out what your sphere of influence is. What is your sphere of influence? Where do you have influence? And how can you grow it? And it might be in your workplace with your coworkers, uh, or it might be on your street, in your neighborhood, or it might be at your church, or it might be uh, in the parent association at your school. And you need to figure out what sphere of influence you have, or it might be on social media or Facebook. You figure out what that sphere of influence is, and then how you can slowly begin to build, to build it in, in order to uh, move forward with specific actions or initiatives. And you know, there's some great, great examples. And any great city that exists, um, surprise, surprise, it's rarely been a, a great political leader who came along, no offense to the political leaders in the room, who play a fundamental role. Uh, but usually, there's a group of impassioned citizens who come together, they recognize their sphere of influence, they come together and they develop a strategy and they identify what the, you know, maybe the three key things are that need to change. And then they seek to build more understanding and build more believers. And it's a virtuous cycle as you do that. And the more people who believe and the more people who understand, that's actually going to affect your political leadership. And when people complain to me, as they do sometimes in public, public meetings about what they perceive to be a lack of leadership at City Hall, insert Rob Ford joke here, um, the, 
the reality is, is that we get the leaders we deserve in a democracy, right? We control that. We choose, our, we choose our leaders. So if we don't like the leadership, we either need to run for leadership or we need to build capacity to shape that leadership in some way. Be agents of change within our own, within our own city. I was actually having a conversation with Glenn who keeps coming up in conversation. I think you're onto something, Glenn. Um, <laughs> talking to Glenn the other day and he had said the best form of economic development, the best strategy of economic development is to essentially uh, shop where you want to develop. So patronize the stores that you want to stay in business, shop at the, re or go to the restaurants that you want to stay existent for the next five years, spend money where you say you want things to succeed. It's Well, I use that so example. Simple. I use that example in my own your city, uh, in my own your city talk, which is that if you believe that, that uh, local economic development matters and local commerce matters and entrepreneurialism matters, you can choose that by shopping local and patronizing local shops instead of going to, you know, Walmart or Costco shop. You can choose to reinforce that in your city. And the extent to which you then can draw others to choose that as well, you begin to build that part of the economy in your city. You can choose to cycle if you believe that, you know, cycling is an important part of our transportation infrastructure and you can depute on it and you can write your counselors and you can hold workshops or seminars and events and build awareness about the importance of cycling as a form of transportation. You can choose to make the city something of your own imagining. I, I really honestly believe that and in part I guess you know I'm sort of lucky I'm, I'm immersed in in that in a very tangible way. So be the change that you want to see. Yeah you know I'll give you an example. Um, Someone said to me, uh, you know, I was talking in a talk about, about my neighborhood and uh, the way I move about my neighborhood because I've discovered that for most Canadians it's actually sort of radical to be able to do all those things within walking distance. And someone said to me, well, you're just really lucky that you live there. And I said, no, I'm not actually. I chose it. Um, and I was fortunate that I was able to chose it. But I also now live in a smaller house than I did before because I bought a smaller house that cost me more money to be closer to the subway. That was a choice I made. Not a lot of people, not a lot of people at my age, buy, as they're having kids, buy a smaller house. I made that choice because I wanted to be close to the subway. And in part, I was thinking into the future and thinking, wow, I'm going to have a teenager someday and I want those teenagers to take the subway because I'm not going to be that mom driving kids around the city. And I'm not. I have a 13-year-old who zips all over the city on the, on the TTC. And I'm hugely grateful for that. But I also I sort of chose that, too. I thought through what mattered to me and made those choices. I, in my walk to school talk, I talk about um, how, because a lot of parents say to me, well, my kids can't walk to school because you know we've got ho hockey halfway across the city or whatever it might be. We made a choice as a family after a couple of years of my husband taking my daughter all over the city. You know, ballet was way over here and then she had swimming way over here. We sat down as a family and said, okay, we're only doing after school programs if they're within walking distance of either the school or our house, which um, tends to be the same thing. So that was a choice we made. There are certain things she simply can't do or my son can't do because that's a principle for how we're operating our household. It's a choice that we made. And I think we, we have much more power than we sometimes think we do. We can make these choices. As individuals. And, as individuals yeah. and make, make the city of our own choosing. So what about, what about City Hall then? Because I want to, two, two real kind of maybe final questions to, to wrap this off. Uh, the low hanging fruit, that's the, those are the individual things that we can do, the low hanging fruit, make those choices individually. A lot of business leaders, city, staff, politicians in this room tonight, uh, from, a, from an organizational, from a government point of view, what's the low-hanging fruit that, that exists kind of anywhere that really doesn't need 15 years of study and, and a 20-year implementation? What can we do tomorrow when we leave here? Well, um, I actually think the biggest low-hanging fruit in any city um, is cycling lanes. I really do. I think they're really easy to do. I think it's really easy to create a culture of respect for cyclists, even if you don't have the cycling lanes. Uh, that's actually what Portland did. Portland produced brochures on how to make cycling safe for women. They did all kinds of advocacy campaigns. They identified streets that they put on a map. Nothing changed about the street except they put it on a map and called it a priority cycling street. 
uh, particularly within neighborhoods and not on main arterials, so that you can go through certain neighborhoods and you'll see a sea of people cycling by. The infrastructure wasn't changed. It was all about just changing the way people think about their city. I think that's, that's low-hanging fruit. I think there's also probably a lot of low-hanging fruit, although I can't be specific about it, related to the energy and the thinking and the work that's being undertaken at McMaster and Mohawk, that really having a university and college that are drivers for city building and taking all that youthful energy and momentum and entrepreneurialism and risk taking and somehow connecting that into city building is really low hanging fruit. Just getting students engaged and active in the city. Uh, other low hanging fruit um, in Canada in the past 30 years, we've become a country where children primarily walked to school, where a country where children are primarily driven to school. Uh, we've shifted that in just one generation. Correspondingly, we've seen childhood obesity uh, go through the roof. There's a direct correlation. So our schools taking ownership of the importance of active transportation and getting kids walking to school, it's just about education. It's just about talking with parents, ensuring that there's safe routes to school, ensuring that other parents are aware that children are walking to school and ensuring that there's lots of access for children around the school to be safe, bike parking at schools. Uh, I don't know the stat in Hamilton, but I'm sure it's not very different, if not higher. In Toronto, 30% of our rush hour traffic between eight and nine in the morning is generated by children being dropped off at school. Most of those children live within two kilometers of their school. Not all of them, but a pretty a, a good portion of them do. So there's some really low-hanging fruit. So I hosted an active transportation summit with the district school board last week, a new partnership. We'd never worked together before to get the school board in the room and say, hey, look, we want kids to be healthy. We also want our city to be healthy. Uh, is there something that we can do working with parents to get children walking to school? You do not need to build anything. It's just a pro, it's programmatic. And there's some great examples, I think there's a few great examples in this city where through the Metrolinx uh, commute program where schools have taken on the walk to school as being a fundamental part of transforming the school culture. So again, really low hanging fruit, transform the health of children, transform the health of neighborhoods, create a stronger sense of community just by getting children walking to school. And looking long term now, because a lot of the stuff that you, you spoke about you know, it's very easy on a PowerPoint to hit the button five times and, and grass shows up and street cars <laughs> show up and buses show up and people are drinking at a Starbucks and it's like, boom, wow, complete street. Um, that obviously takes a lot of time. So do we have to be patient? Do we really have to be patient? Don't be patient. Don't be patient. Be bold. Uh, and it's funny to hear you say that about the click, 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 because I spend many hours of my week sitting in meetings fighting over those plans and fighting over the most minute detail like you know where the bike parking is going to go at a certain station stop like we're, we're like in this constant struggle with with Metrolinx as we go through this process not because we don't have a shared interest because we do but because uh, it all comes down to money and we're fighting over who's going to pay for stuff so it is the farthest thing from easy it's very difficult but I think you have to be very bold um, and you have to be very very choosy you have to set very high standards for your city and that you have to be willing to call the shots as a city and to not settle uh, Try pilot projects like New York City did. Try things out because that's a really good way to learn what works and what doesn't work. But when you're building your long-term infrastructure, do it right. Make an investment uh, like future generations did. Or we'll pay for it tomorrow. And well, tomorrow. well or, or you'll, you'll be a city in decline because other cities are doing this and you have a pretty, it's a pretty narrow opportunity to either uh, jump on the bandwagon and create a great place, a great city um, that is sustainable and economically prosperous with a diverse economy. Either do that, or I think you'll find yourself really struggling in the long term. If you had to, uh, if you had to summarize everything that you've said tonight, would ambition be a, a good word? Um, I think. I think you know my closing statements about being ambitious. Um, I mean that quite passionately. I think you have 
Hamilton is an unbelievable city. There's so many assets here that are profoundly unique. And I think there's a great risk if you're not ambitious enough. And being willing to make those really substantive, you know, all that low-hanging fruit, that's really important. But being able to make those big decisions is important too. Like aggressively moving forward with your light rail transit infrastructure, that's a game changer for the city. That is a game changer. And we need to be thinking about investing in the infrastructure that's a legacy for future generations. What will your children's children thank you for? That's what you need to be investing in today. And our generation, we haven't really done our part yet in terms of making those investments, the kinds of investments that uh, earlier city builders made. We haven't, we haven't done it yet, and we need to do that. So we start tomorrow. OK. <laughs> Thank you so much. My pleasure. Jennifer Keyes back. Jennifer, thank you very much for doing this. Um, as I said before, you have uh, clearly distinguished yourself since uh, leaving uh, the city, and it's great to experience it firsthand. Um, a lot of the hard truths, I, I really appreciated those, but I, I, I felt almost some gasps within the audience at, at times, and I don't know if they were audible or if it was just me being ultra sensitive because I'm hosting this event. Um, <laughs> and I'm thinking, is this, a, is this what a Chamber of Commerce needs to deliver to the community? But, but yes, it absolutely is, and, and I might be slightly outside of that, uh, that key demographic, um, but I don't wanna be a part of a city in which what you're talking about is radical. So uh, you have certainly uh, earned a uh, print from one of my favorite artists, uh, Paul Ilya, and uh, thank you so much for being a part of uh, this first Ambitious City event. And thank you all so much for being here. Um, it truly has been uh, a pleasure to, uh, to present this event uh, to you tonight. Thank you. Thank you.